Boy, George. Hi, George. So I was uh, asking the Lord what to prepare and put together. I came across uh, things related to generous giving. So I thought yes. I'd talk about this for a few sessions. Um, God's, reveal, God's Word reveals to us who God is. And certainly we recognize that our God is a generous God. That's one of his attributes. We see over and over in Scripture God's mentioning of the poor and how the poor were a concern of this. In fact, in, uh, it was prophesied in Isaiah and then Jesus stated in Luke chapter 4, verse 14 through 19, where he read from the book of Isaiah and he, says, he gave his mission statement, so to speak. And one of the first line was that he was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. And then God had mercy on the Israelites after 400 years in slavery to the Egyptians. He brought them out of bondage. He made them ultimately a very rich nation. They turned their back. And this message here with the Shemitah year, etc., etc., we see God's hand. But God has always had a heart for the poor. Yes. Um, so we know God is generous. So what's, what about us? We know that's God's, that's God's attribute or one of them. But what about us? Well, let's look at Proverbs chapter 22, verse 9. Short three words. I can remember this. Proverbs 22, 9. He who has a generous eye will be blessed. Wow. For he gives of his bread to the poor. So the question is, do we look for opportunities to give? Mm -hmm. Certainly Jesus did. And of course people were seeking him out for miracles. But he was always looking for opportunities to give, to preach to the poor and to, to help them. But do you have in your heart a desire to give such that you look for opportunities to do so? He wants us to be like Jesus, and he wants us to be a man or woman after his own heart, too. <clears throat> then let's look at Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will the fresh flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap, if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all especially to those who are of the household of faith. Mm -hmm. So we see Paul, by God's Spirit, writing to the church to be generous, um, to sow seeds of goodness, and to not become weary in doing good. So let's pray. Father, we just pray and thank you for your goodness and your generosity in giving. You set the example. You set the bar. Father, let our hearts be open. Let our minds be focused on your word, which shows your love to give. That's who you are, a giving God, a loving God, a caring God. Father, you've given us so much. Father, as we give gifts today, Lord, we seek to imitate Christ. We seek to give to the poor. We seek to give to those who, who provide ministry. We seek to give to our brothers and sisters in need. <clears throat> so, Father... Let us give abundantly and with joy and cheerfully and sacrificially today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you today about what this means, transforming, being renewed in your mind, so it appears to me that the power of God is not so interested in behavior modification. Anybody realize that? <clears throat> He's more interested in total surrender. Amen. Oh, wow. Total surrender to Christ. That, because that causes a, a permanent heart transformation. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And it also changes your body chemistry. Hallelujah. As we align ourselves with the word of God and 
and, and, and keeping in mind that total surrender to Christ is a form of worship in spirit and truth. I um, met with a man yesterday that I um, <coughs> got with um, after we played the concert with Phil Kelly. I don't remember how many months ago that was, and he was from basically he was um, from South Africa. He grew up in England, <coughs> and so he's, he's a scientist at uh, Emory University, and uh, he, he's willing to share this testimony. So I just thought I'd give it to you now. He, he ruined his ears, he's listening as a teenager to the rock, and he just, you know, kids listen to way too loud. And so he had a time nights, his constant ringing in his ear for, I'm guessing, like 20 years. <clears throat> and um, knowing the power of God and the Holy Spirit, I just looked at him and said, Let me pray for you. God healed him. And he was just stunned, I and mean, he's still stunned. So he, his wife came because she wanted me to pray for her now. Mm. She's from China. Yeah. Um, this is what the church should be doing, you know. Um, Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed to the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable, the perfect will of God. So I believe that the word of God expresses here that he actually expects us. I don't want anybody to be offended here, but God expects us to be radical. Yes, amen. He wants us to be radically transformed. Amen. And, and, and continue in his word, so we're made free. And I know some people think I'm pretty radical. Right. I want to be more radical. I'm expecting God to do work and be just like that he's doing in you because we're all work in progress. You know, in John 8, 31, then Jesus said unto those Jews that believed on him, if, there's a big word, if, if you continue in my word, then I'll you, <coughs> you be my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. So in other words, after we got born again and we continue to study to show ourselves the fruit, the Lord expects us to be totally different than somebody with a worldly perspective. And yet, we see a lot of Christians that are walking around with a worldly perspective as soon as they get out of church. They go right back to that worldly perspective. So it's going to take some, you know, mental effort here to apply the Word of God. It says in James 2.14, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say you have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Well, you're saved by faith, aren't you? But see, that's not what James is saying here. James is not referring to that initial justification of faith. He's, he's rather um, seeing that the, the demonstration of faith in the life of a true believer. The world wants, you know, the world's watching. Are, are you going to act like a child of God? Because Christianity demands that its followers do good. All the time, amen? amen. So you can't afford to be entertaining a spirit of aggravation or any other unclean spirit. It goes on to say in James in verse 15 If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding to give them those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without my works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. See, faith without works is dead, just like um, you know, works without faith is dead. Fire burning without fuel can't really work, can it? Or fuel without fire. You want to go to get, I mean, I know somebody said, what's possible? It was that burning bush. Mm -hmm. But that, that was you know, something supernatural going on. The laws that govern fire and fuel say that we need fire and fuel to work together. So it's rather clear from studying Genesis when Abraham, he was tested. Do you think you get tested? Abraham was tested to prove his faith in God when he was asked to offer up his beloved son Isaac. And if Abraham would have refused, 
it would have demonstrated what? That Abraham did not have faith in the word of God. So God's looking for those that are hungry and thirsty for him more than the things of this world. So your heart cries out to the Lord so you experience his presence. And then signs and wonders and healings and miracles follow you. You know, when I pray for the at the end, just like I prayed for the army, I'm, I'm full of faith. I'm going, I know God to do this. It's his word. He sent his word to heal you. So the Lord sent some. Um, you know, that baptism of fire, while we're here, thank you, Lord. So that, it, it burns things up. It burns up those things that are hindering you. You need that baptism of fire. Mm -hmm. So you can receive the blessings and the promises. <coughs> so the Lord sent John the Baptist to announce the arrival of Jesus, to preach repentance, something we don't hear a lot today. And he was baptizing those with water, you know, that we could repent. And, um, what's this reason? In Matthew, um, Matthew 3, 11 says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So people get ready. I reckon that being baptized with fire will burn up those things in your life that need to go. And, and all those things that are hindering you that need to go in Jesus' almighty name, they need to be burnt up. And we're given such awesome gifts, and the Lord gives us it through the Holy Spirit baptism. And we read in, in Matthew 13, 12, For whosoever hath to him it shall be given, and, and he shall have in more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even what he has. So if you're seeking the Lord in his kingdom and his righteousness, and you've received the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, how much more? I mean, really, how much more does God want to bless you with signs and wonders that follow you? See, we're not created for an ordinary life. We're created to be radical. A life, living a life that glorifies Christ. So it can be a light in this darkness of this world. This world's a dark place. God's calling us to be a light. So we walk in miracles in the glory of his name. Amen. Amen. That every day we're becoming more like Christ. Getting away from worldly perspectives. You've got to stop training yourself to think more like God thinks about these things. So when things happen, things that are discouraging, you don't react in a worldly way. You don't react with worldly perspective. You react out of the word of God. Walk in faith, not by how things look. Amen. Mm -hmm. See those demons that are assigned to try to um, be entertained. That's what they want. They want to be entertained, right? And in and, and, and our thought life, and they, they, they try to deceive us into to even wanting to avoid those things that are that need to be removed from our life cast out, you know, those things that are interfering with our destiny in Christ. And we true believers, you know, going to might have to face the demons of the past to find victory in, in the present and future. Because we've not been given a spirit of fear. This also tells us, you know, James 1.22, be a doer of the word and not fear is only deceiving your own self. We've got to come to terms with these things. Um, I heard this testimony. I remember, there was a pastor. Um, and, and keep in mind that, that this man had, had seen a lot of super. And he, he was walking in, in, in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So he saw a lot of miraculous things. But he misplaced his keys. So he, he got this, this idea that um, since he was knocked out, he just jumped over the fence. So he did that, and in the process of jumping over the fence, because he misplaced the keys, he broke his foot. 
And the first thing he did was ask God's forgiveness for entertaining that foolish idea to jump over a high fence like the Edson. Some of the members of his church came out and helped him into his office, pulled off his shoe, and his foot by now um, it was blowing up and it was all black and blue, looked like a blue line up, you know. The office staff all saw this and and he made this amazing statement. He said, My foot is broken. You can tell it, you know, you can feel it was broken. He said, But God has healed me. Well that sounds like a contradiction. You just said your foot's broken and but you're saying God has healed me. Which one is it? So he goes home and he's in tremendous pain. And now um, he, he pulls off his, his, his shoe and he, it's in the mid afternoon, I guess, and and um, He's lying there in, 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 in a lot of pain, and, and the Lord speaks to him and says, I thought you said you were healed. What are you doing lying here in the middle of the afternoon resting? And, and so the spirit of faith begins to rise up in him. So he um, goes, you're right, Lord, I, I am healed by your stripes. I was healed. So he, he, he takes his foot and he, and he slams it down on on you know, at the floor of his bedroom. He says, in the name of Jesus, be healed. He slams his foot down. And he passes out <laughs> in the pain. He comes to, you know, probably a few minutes later, and he does it again. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And he passes out another time. And this goes on four more times. And the fifth time, he was determined because he'd not even think about it, he'd seen miraculous things. The fifth time he, he did this, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Threw his foot down as hard as he could, it was instantly healed. Glory to God. So he runs back, he's dancing around, you know, dancing praises to God now. Because the shoe be a gun. The, the black and blue even started to fade away. And he goes back to the church and goes, Look, God just did. Hallelujah, right? Um, see, sometimes we give up too easily because the, the enemy is so great at deceiving. You just got to know the word of God, you know. Um, <coughs> well, mind you, this kind of reminds me of Mark Smith Wigglesworth going around punching people because that's the way he got healed. God used him in a lot of miraculous healings. And, you know, they say, well, why are you, you know, punching people? Because I'm not punching people. I'm, I'm punching the devil and get in the way. But they were, they were healed. Unless God's, you know, um, instructing to do that, I don't suggest anybody try yet. Unless you, you know, doing the same kind of, working in the same kind of apostolic calling. And that's a good thing to, to seek in the Lord. But I'm, it just reminds me of how it, it seems illogical so many times the things that God are calling us to do. But that's what He wants. He wants you radical and to think like He thinks, not like the world thinks. Amen? In Numbers, in Numbers 20, 11, it says, And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and the beast also. And here see the people that were murmuring against they're murmuring and complaining against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. And, and, and the Lord told them to speak to the rock. He, he was in rebellion. Now I understand he was agitated at this point because of the, 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 the church being about a million and a half people all complaining, murmuring. But see, Moses and Aaron in, in the rebellion this time they, they basically took the glory of this supernatural act on themselves. And God isn't going to share glory with you. And Moses, you know, he <coughs> did things like a lot of us. He said things and did things that he shouldn't have. God still, you know, used him mightily. But that same spirit of pride is it's what comes in and it hinders people. It's a spirit of pride. It's rebellion. I've got the, so think about who taught you to somehow be, become like you know your own wisdom. 
your own self-righteousness. As well as if you can gain sanctification, redemption with all the incredible shed blood of Jesus. Because that's what's going on. There's suddenly too many people, they fall into this sinful state of independence. And then, you know, there's nothing more than a spirit of rebellion in the end. And when we willfully sin, we're sinning against the Lord and Him alone. See, I think when you look at this, the, the voice of God appears to condemn such things on just about every page of the Holy Scriptures. In, in Hebrews 6, 6 it says, If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves to the Son of God afresh and put them to an open shame. The consequences of willfully sinning it's like you're crucifying Jesus all over again, and the enemy's just laughing his head off. And think for a true believer, no matter what you're doing, understanding that the, you know, the Lord is doing a work in you. It says in 2 Corinthians 3 1, but we all, with open face beholding, as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed from the same image from glory to glory, even as the Spirit of the Lord. So, studying the Holy Scripture, we find. <coughs> This theme that, that, that's used in a number of different ways expressed their idea as believers were being changed into the image and likeness of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? I read somewhere where Smith Wigglesworth was quoted as saying, If you're the same, if you're in the same place you were yesterday, you're a backsliter. He didn't mention you know, words, he just told it on words. So should we be you know Reflecting some of God's glory, I think we should. Everywhere we go, we should be reflecting the glory of God. And the more we seek the Lord, the more we're hungry and thirsty for His righteousness and His kingdom. We ought to start shining some of that glory. We're being transformed. This is what that transformation is. From our innermost being, because we, we're connected to, to the Lord Jesus, right? We're, he's the Holy Vine, understanding that we're totally lost. We can't take a breath without Him. In John 15, 5, I'm the vine, he are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. That the, you know, from the depths of our heart, we're, we're being transformed into the, in the image and likeness of the Lord Jesus. We're being transformed from glory, his glory, from glory to glory. As this Greek word, metamorpho, which means being transformed in English, it's become the word metamorphosis, meaning to change one state of a thing into a different state. In biology, it means um, the profound change from one state in the next in the life of a, an organism, such as we observe the, the caterpillar, right? It turns into the pupa and then the pupa into an adult butterfly. What do you think is going on with you? See, the, the, the true born again Christian we ought to be seeing a complete change in character happening. It should alter our appearance. It brings us an atmosphere of holiness everywhere we go. Luke 9, 23 says, And he said unto them, Jesus said unto them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If you don't deny yourself, you're entertaining a spirit of pride. So after we follow Jesus, we surrender as, as a true worshipper. We love him with everything we have. And, um, with this positive, you know, change takes, it, it, our character, our, our perceptions are, are changed and altered. Our inner appearance begins to reflect more and more the glory of Jesus in our lives as we submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit and worship him in spirit and truth. Because right? it says in John 4, um, 24, God is the spirit, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So how awesome to see this connection that we're, we're, we're ever being in, increasing in glory every day, being transformed more and more into his image and likeness. Putting on the mind of Christ. See, personally, I think, and it's a tremendous encouragement, that no matter um, what's happening in this fallen world, we're indeed blessed. There's, there's, there's terrible things going on, but we're still blessed. Amen. Right? Amen. We're being transformed bit by bit, just as our thought life changes DNA. 
from one degree to the glory of another as we follow up to the Lord Jesus. Now I realize that, you know, that sometimes things are not so easy, not, some things are not so you know, easy, they, they can be really difficult, there's lots of challenges out there. Just ask a Christian in the Middle East right now, they've lost everything they've had, you know, they've lost their family, their friends, they've had to just leave suddenly, just leave. Imagine just walking out of your home with just whatever you're wearing, whatever you can carry, and, and escaping with your life, because this is what's going on. The persecutions here, these trials and tribulations, and yet from the scriptures we, we, we see that all trials, all tribulations for the true believer, they have a divine purpose. <coughs> Even if we don't understand, how could they be allowed to happen, these horrible things that are happening? God says in Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good for them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. So, for part God's ultimate purpose for each one of us was to grow more, more into His image and His likeness each day. Amen. Mitzias goes on to say in, in verse twenty-nine, "For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren." So that we've got trials, we've got tribulations happening in this world, that they serve a purpose, and that providing we stay in faith. In, in 1 Peter 4.12 it says, Beloved, that would be the church, think, not, think it not strange concerning fiery trials, which is, is to try you as though some strange things happened unto you. See, nobody wants to go through difficulties. But we all face them at times, and at least if we're going to face them, face them as a true believer. Face them in faith. Make the Lord proud of you. In James 1, 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect way, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And if you lack wisdom, ask let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave in the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double minded means unstable in all his ways. Those are true born again believers. We need to be on God. We've got to be on God carefully. Guarding what goes on in our thought life. Because those thought life, you know, it, it, it's going to determine your body, how it expresses itself in health or sickness. Now, at DSA, we need to continually think on the things that are true and noble and pure and holy. What we read about in Philippians 4.8. And the devil's gone, yeah, well, look at all this terrible stuff. Okay, we can look here at it. We can observe it. We can see it according to the word of God, but we're still required to think on these good things. And however, more importantly, we need to guard ourselves against entertaining any of those toxic thoughts that, that, that come. Um, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, the, the things that hinder you. Because, um, you know, we've got 30,000, 70,000 thoughts a day. It's going to take some work to demonstrate your faith. And, and your obedience and being radical to, to overtake, be an overcomer in the, in the areas that you in your life, practicing forgiving everybody that forgives you, you know, offends you. Forgive all of them, including yourself. Because oh, otherwise it's like the devil just um, gives you a toxic thought. Come on, those people have offended you. Don't forgive them. <laughs> no, 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 don't be. And, and, and then the devil just sits back and watches you self destruct because all of a sudden now you're going to release toxic chemicals into your body. It's not worth it, is it? We've got to be radical and do what God says. Amen? Yeah. It says in 1 Corinthians 6 20, that you have bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. And in your spirit, which is God's. Well, wait a minute. If this is God's body, what are you doing entertaining unclean thoughts? What are you doing entertaining demonic entities? I mean, how is it that even 50 years ago, with all these prophetic you know, signs that were unfolding, 
Jesus would warn us about that only so few people took notice. And now they're accelerating, right? Now, now people are starting to wake up. <coughs> and see, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There has no temptation taken you, but such as common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted about what you are able. But will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. So here's the Israelites, right? They're pressed in on every side, no escape, and God pops the water for them, they walk through and try the end. What do you think he's going to do for you? Yeah. See, it seems sad to me that um, all these difficulties going on right now, with prophetically, you know, the evidence is mounting up that um, we're expecting his return in our lifetime. Hallelujah. Keep looking up. Right? And sadly, you know, the statistics are showing that I just have to tell you again, the statistics are showing more people in this nation and UK are believing that an extraterrestrial is going to come save them. More than the, the God of the Bible. The church has failed. Because it's not been radical. It's not been sharing the gospel. It's not, you know, it's like you're walking around just doing a test, you know, just sharing the word of God, sharing the love of God. It, it heals people. This is where we're supposed to be. So the scriptures tell us. Um, I mean, there's more and more, you know, video footage um, revealing these strange entities flying about. Um, mm -hmm. and the churches, most for the most part, don't want to deal with it. So we have to deal with it here. It says in the scriptures, men's heart, you know, that they're going to faint from the fear of what's coming on the earth, what's coming on the earth. That would make people faint in fear. It begs the, it begs the question, what, what is this that he's going on to? Um, I know my, my friend Ali Mazzuli showed some footage that the Gary Sturman, Gary is one of the most brilliant men, and he just looked at it and said, it looks like they're, they're doing maneuvers, like they're practicing for some kind of D-Day. Okay? So you need to prepare your hearts, because things can change radically. Just think how three days changed the world's history. From the crucifixion to the resurrection. See, when you encounter these new ages, because they're all over the place, um, and they're so convinced that these highly evolved intelligent beings, you know, from outer space, and then you have to um, kind of ask them, you know, how do you know that these are, <coughs> how do you know that they're, they're benevolent and not benevolent? How do you know this? They're so convinced. So I started challenging, you know, because they don't know the word of God at all. So lest you start telling them, they, they have their clueless. It says in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers for righteousness, then their end should be called into their works. So I tell you, all the, these, these trials, all these tribulations, we still have victory. Hallelujah. <coughs> Praise God, because he gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, although we're in a spiritual battle, Everybody knows this, right? We're in a spiritual battle every day. Satan still has no authority over a true believer. Think about it. He's got no authority. Anything he's done, he does by deceiving. Getting you to come into some agreement somewhere. So I think it's time to use that supernatural power that the Lord Jesus has granted us to do. Well, I, I, would, I would agree with that. <laughs> I agree with that. It tells us in, in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in, in, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So if we're going to be radically changed as believers and walk in such power of the Holy Spirit, 
We, we boldly share the gospel, heal the sick, cast all demons in the almighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We, we just need to accept God's offer, this, this incredible offer. I mean, how many people accept the offer of, of salvation and, and then they don't fully accept the offer of healing, which is part of salvation? <coughs> I mean, how is it we, we, we ask people, um, can we come pray for you, minister? And they go, no, no, I'm okay. You know, this, you, you know they're like just little hospital lines, but they go, no, I don't, I don't need you to pray for me. I mean, that, it's, it's incredible that people will act that way. You can see how desperate they are, they, they don't understand. And you can't do one thing for anybody that they're not going to allow God to do. The Lord tells us in Psalm 103, too, Bless the Lord in my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, and healeth all thy diseases. Why have so often people forget the benefits? We were taught to accept salvation by faith and, and count it done, whether we feel it or not. Some people have a dramatic, you know, kind a dramatic encounter, but some people don't. They don't have a, you know, a lot of feelings that go out to them. If you ask the Lord that in his almighty name of Jesus as Savior, he says he saves you, whether you feel it or not. So after you recognize this and we line in, in the word of God and you've know, offered up a prayer of faith, <clears throat> why is it so many people can falter at this point? For example, if healing is asked for, you should count it done, but then, you know, regardless of feelings and symptoms. Just what this man did, kept slamming his foot down, right? That's what he did. Regardless of the symptoms, he went, no, this is what the Word of God says. In the name of Jesus, foot be healed. You know, I, I can concur with that. I prayed for a lady that had a broken foot, and she went back to the doctors the next day, they didn't understand how come with this foot that was broken with an x-ray, now they have an x-ray with the foot that's not broken. Well, I, I didn't do that. God did that. But I got to be part of it when I got to say something that causes this to happen. Because God wants to use you this way. See, in Mark 11, 24, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, you shall have them. For Paul, God has given us his word to guide us, his Holy Spirit to, to enable us. And, and what a privilege to, to come before the Lord like this. He's also sure that no trial will test us beyond our ability to bear it. He'll also provide a way so we can stand up, you know, and carry on. Besides, what's the worst thing that can hit when you die and go be with the Lord the day of resurrection, get a glorified body? Right. <clears throat> See, because the end of the for the true believer, think about it. Death. It, it's not the end. It's just another beginning. You begin a new life in the, in, in the new book, the Lamb's Book of Life. Here, our life begins, a, you know, a, a new physical death here on earth. Second Timothy one ten <coughs> says. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.10 It is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the Gospel. So the, the, the last death will be the death of death. It says in 1 Corinthians 15.25 For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And when you realize that Jesus ruined every funeral he ever attended. <laughs> right? He did. He, ra he would raise the dead every time he showed up at the funeral. I think we need to be, you know, get to understand this. First Corinthians 2 9 says, But it, it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the hearts of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So we become a new creation. And, and the moment we're born again, we're, we're truly transformed. That old person has got to go. Good for that, right? And the new person comes. Second Corinthians 5, 17, you know, tells us, Therefore, if any man be Christ, he's a new creature. The, the old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. 
And so it just seems to me that so often the Lord forgives us all our sins, washes us clean from all unrighteousness, and then we tend to go back and get into more trouble. We entertain toxic thinking instead of putting on the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16 For who has known the mind of Christ that he may instruct him, but we've got the mind of Christ. We've got the mind of Christ. For God's sake, use it. It's so important to confess these things and keep pressing in and staying on that narrow pathway we're called to, which is called in a positive sanctification process. And this John 1 9, if we confess our sins, but a lot of times what happens is people don't want to confess them. And then the enemy's holding it over you and he's accusing you and, and, he, and he's, he's messing with you day and night. You're in torment. Do what God says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we say we've not been sin. We make him a liar. The word's not in us. So when you allow just any thought to wander through your mind with all these fences to keep all the bad ones, you can get into a lot of trouble. That's why the scriptures warn us about a city with his walls torn down in Proverbs 25, 28. He that has no rule over his spirit like a city with, that, that, that is broken down without walls. So those demons can come and, and go as they please. Is there any place that you're not willing to yield completely and surrender to Jesus? That's that place where the enemy's wandering in and out. Maybe like holding on to a record of wrongs, spirit of bitterness. The Bible says it's like a city you know, we've got to protect it from the invading armies. And your soul's part of your mind, will, and emotions. So if you allow any of these walls to be torn down, the enemy's immediately you've got free access to your mind. He's got free access to your will and your emotions. And then you start doing things that you don't want to do. And you're like, Paul, doing things that I don't want to do and not doing the things I should be doing. So then he can send in confusion, you know, he can send in unforgiveness, anger, and bring you to a place of depression. Spirit of heaviness. And then that does what? It brings in the spirit of self-hatred. Because he gets the enemy just sets you up and then he stands big like and he watches you self-destruct. The devil wants to influence and control you in know, our will. When these, those walls are torn down, surprising, you know, to find somebody experiencing all kinds of you know problems with especially like addictions. Because the Lord Jesus said he can't serve two masters, right? Nobody can serve two masters, for either he's going to will hate one or love the other, or will be held on to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and man. So I tell you, in uncontrolled thoughts are like walls that are torn down. And then the devil's able to come in with all kinds of deceptions and filthy lies. You've got to fight me because you are a Christian soldier. You are an overcomer. You can't allow those things that, that, that mess with your, your life. It's well worth examining every thought, ask for its passport. Have you got a passport? Let me see. You can't come in my mind until you show me your passport. And then I can stamp it. Yes, sir. <coughs> so when you're born again, everything changes. You become like a new species. I mean, we become a peculiar type of person, right? So the Bible tells us we're a peculiar person because we're able... I mean, peculiar people move in supernatural signs, right? Supernatural signs and wonders. That's peculiar to the world. Well, hallelujah. We're a new species. Praise so we can do John 14, 12. You know, there's some greater things that we could do in Jesus' name. So the scriptures, you know, speaks about the, the, the first Adam. Who was, you know, think about the, the first Adam was probably like, um, he was a genius. He was like Da Vinci and, and, and Einstein rolled into one. I mean, it took some great you know, intellect to be able to name all the animals and give them names with meanings. He was able to do that. And then, it, it, I pondered this or not, when I studied Genesis, but whether Adam was so in love with Eve that he willfully sinned, knowing that what she did would, would cause her to be he is down for eternity, that he willfully went with her. I, I've got to be with her. He was so in love. I mean, what, what caused him to do this? It doesn't really tell us, but we can speculate here. And then, however, we got the second Adam. 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who is sinless and holy to make a way that we can all be redeemed. It says in, in Romans 5, 19, for as one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Hallelujah for that. In 1 Corinthians 15, 44, it says, it is sown a natural body and is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And so it is written that the first Adam was made a living soul and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. We don't come here unless we're going to get deep, right? Okay. So how be it, says in verse 46, how be it that was not the first was which was spiritual, but that which was natural, and afterwards that which was spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is, is from the Lord from heaven. And as the earthy, such as they are also that are earthy, and as, as is the heavenly, such as also are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we also bear the image of the heavenly. So in other words, our resurrected bodies, we still have we still have flesh and bones. That's extraordinary, right? And in general, we'll be just like Jesus. In Luke um, 24, 39, Mary says, Behold my hands and feet, it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see I have. So spirit bodies can be real, but because there is substance of a higher element in natural bodies. And for God, you know, he made his angels, then they have spirit bodies. Uh, for example, they, they also have a, a real tangible, materialized um, bodies that, are, that, that have been proven in hundreds and hundreds of scriptures we could find. Um, in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. See, angels are, are, are um, mentioned at least 108 times in the Old Testament and 165 times in the New Testament. So I reckon um, that's an ample information the Holy Scripture allows us to, to build an understanding of some knowledge of these angelic beings. And by the way, there's some here now. And then they've got a special category. We've got, you know, cherub, and we've got the this, sapphire, this and we've got the archangel. Angels are, 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 are um, certainly not a race that descended from a, a, a common ancestor like we are. They, they're, that's not how they were created. For one thing, Scripture calls us sons of men, but angels are called sons of angels. You know, Luke, um, <clears throat> Luke 20, 34, Jesus answering said unto them, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they which would be counted worthy to obtain that will and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and the children of God being children of the resurrection. So this doesn't mean that there will be sexless, and it is going to be sexless in, in the next world. Rather, it means that those resurrected males and females will, will not need to marry to, to carry on the race. And those, the people in the natural world will still continue on. In 1 Corinthians 6, um, well, actually, you can see that I won't go through it now, but it's 1 Corinthians 15, about 35 to 58, when you, if you want to study it later. And in 1 Corinthians 6 20, it says, For we are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This is absolutely essential to be radical for Christ. And once we understand this, we ought to be able to adjust our attitude and our minds in a way that, that are pleasing to God. In Ephesians 4, 23, it says, And be renewed in your spirit of your mind, so that we, when we live in faith, we, we live as the Holy Spirit's leading us. And in Galatians 5, 16, it says, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, doesn't that make complete sense? If you walk in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's guiding you, you're not going to give in to worldly perceptions. And then the enemy doesn't have a chance with you. In Romans 8, 13, it says, For we live after the, the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit of God, to mortify the deeds of your body, you shall live. Thus, therefore, live by the Spirit, not by the flesh, because 
become we become instruments of righteousness instead of you know instruments of wickedness. In Romans six thirteen it says, "Neither yield ye your members are instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God, as those that are alive from the dead, and members of instruments of righteousness unto God." So this is what a transformation is. This is that metamorphosis. Some people tell tell me that I set the bar. Pastor, you just set the bar way too high. And I have to tell them, it's not my bar to set. I didn't do this. This is the word of God. I'm only here to, to instruct the church. I'm here to help equip the church. That's my job. That's my assignment. Um, and besides, how can the Holy God bless you if you're going to want to rebel and stay in sin? So we just need to understand that the power of God always enables us to do what He calls us to do. He's not telling you to do anything that He's not enabled you and equipped you to be able to accomplish. Amen? Because He's called us to be overcomers. Let me um, go back and share from John 15 again. In this one it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean from the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me he can do nothing. If a man abideth in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather and cast him into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Here is, is the Father glorified that you bear much fruit, shall, so shall you also be my disciples. So the Lord's given us His Holy Spirit to be with us. Think about this. God has given us the Holy Spirit to be with us forever. It's not going to depart, right? It's supposed to be with us forever. It says John 14, 16, I will pray the Father and He shall give you another confidence that He might abide with you forever. And even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because He seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him for He dwelleth in you and, and shall be in you. And I, I like what Ryan Hunt came to see it. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit likes to look out your window with your eyes. <clears throat> Again, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? So let's take care of the temple. In 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, what, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which is... You have a God, and you are not your own. So when you start thinking of your body as your own, and doing your own thing, you're in rebellion, you're in sin, and you need to repent. So we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us in our soul and body, and, and, and every thought we entertain become more and more like God and, and His likeness and His image every day. I mean, think about it. We've got that doom in this miracle working power of the Holy Spirit operating in us. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The same Holy Spirit that, 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 that parted the Red Sea, that caused those three young men in, in Daniel 3, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego to, to go into a fiery furnace and, and stay in faith and come out without even the hair singed, not even smelling a smoke. Keeping in mind, you know, a few things about this transformation that we're to experience this. Never forget your work in progress. Just think about how far you've come as a believer when you look back at where you started. Most people don't like to think about what they were like the day before they became born again. But what a, what a, a momentous day that was. And that we're a work in progress. And God's going to continue working with us, you know. So we keep walking out of the, the old, is this part of that walk out? This is renewing the minds, so being transformed. It says in Philippians 2.12, Wherefore, my beloved, 
as you have always obeyed not my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So let us leave here continuing to practice. Make every effort to live a life that's glorifying to God in everything you do, everything you think, everything you say. Amen. Because as he says in Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. This is an absolute requirement. To live a life of holiness means we submit, we, we keep on submitting to fulfill God through Jesus and that means taking every thought captive to the eating to Christ. See, unforgiveness, it, it's going to hinder you. <coughs> it, it's going to grow unhealthy memory trees. It's going to release and send out harmful chemicals from your body, your holy temple, which does not belong to you. See, Jesus is our only example to follow here. And um, you know, when a toxic thought comes, you, you can do what he did. Nevertheless, it is written, and the Holy Spirit will give you the scripture. And think about it, you know. Jesus was incredibly abused. He hung on a cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then he got that man next to him in the salvation. What do you think you should be acting like? Well, another way of healing has been provided for us when we receive the Lord's Supper, which we're going to partake of in a moment. Um, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine, it says, For anyone who eats and drinks the Lord's Supper, without recognizing the, the body the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a, a number of fallen asleep, meaning they, they died, right? That is why um, we've got to take this very seriously. So if anybody's got any issues with anybody, resolve them now, because we can't afford to move another moment without resolving this. Um, 1 Peter 2.24 says, by his wounds we've been healed. So, um, you know, participating in this communion service means physical healing. Okay? If you believe it, you can receive it. I would encourage you to ponder these things as before you take communion. Remember what the Lord's broken body has done for you and receive the benefits of faith, you should expect divine healing to come. It says in um, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, For I have received of the Lord that which I have also delivered unto <coughs> you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we're going to do this and remember to the Lord now. And after the same manner, he took the cup when he stopped saying, this cup is a new testament in my blood. This that you do as often as you drink and remember it to me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death to be come. Wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the, the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself so that him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. But when we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should be not condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together, be tarry one for another, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come together unto condemnation, and the rest is such a when he comes. So, Christ's crucifixion <coughs> was a prophetic fulfillment of the ancient Passover, where the Pharaoh was a type of the shadow of Satan, where, where he, he held the people in bondage. The Lord wants you free today. The Lord has provided an escape for all of us. We're to do this in obedience to Him, just like the early church did. And they came together and they in one accord. So we're coming together in one accord. So, um, Don, could you pass all the elements for us, please?
Let's first confess any sins from our hearts. It's better that we just um, set this one out. Because nobody's going to judge you here if you don't uh, partake. It's far too dangerous to um, partake of this communion if we're not in the right place with the Lord. So by an act of the Holy Spirit, I ask Jesus, Almighty name, we know you'd be allowed to take communion. If we've got a quarrel that needs to be settled and resolved, let them do that first, Lord. Let them be reconciled to each other before they come to your, your table. Amen. Amen. Take a big piece. This is not like the churches used to go to. Take a big piece. I want you to really take time to meditate on what God's done here. It's organic, by the way. <laughs> All right. do this together in one accord. So first, I just want to prepare your hearts to receive this. So, <coughs> about God in heaven, you are so grateful that <coughs> you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Messiah Yeshua, to, to come to this earth to redeem us of all our sins, all the generational iniquities. We're so grateful, Father God. We're so indebted to you for what you did and what you accomplished on the cross to get us free in our mind and body, spirit, and soul, these bodies that belong to you now. So I ask that you would bless this bread that represents your body of Christ and bless this fruit of the vine that re represents your spilled blood. Lord God, I ask that you forgive any of us now. So let's just say this with me. Say, Father God, Father God I ask that you forgive me, <coughs> you forgive me of any and all sins, any and all sins that I have participated with. As I forgive now, as I forgive now anybody that sinned, sinned against me, or hurt me in any way, hurt me in any way. I, forgive them, I forgive them, and I release them now, and I release them now in the all-powerful name all -powerful of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I want you to just really search your heart before we do this, and, and, and if the Lord reveals any place, any trace of disobedience, deal with it now, right where you're sitting, because God can touch you any place and, and reach out of heaven right now. In fact, pray with me to say, Father God, Father God, I purpose and choose, I purpose and choose to, to, to bless those, to bless those that have wronged me, that have wronged me, and I release them, and to release them in the prisons of my thought life, in the prisons of my thought life. And I ask that you bless, bless all those that have wronged me, bless all those that have wronged me, and, and lay not a charge against them, and lay not a charge against them. In Jesus' Almighty name, in Jesus Almighty name. I choose to receive your forgiveness. I choose to receive your forgiveness. So I'm able to forgive myself. I'm able to forgive others. As I forgive all others. As I forgive all others. I receive your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's take the bread first. Let's take our time. This represents Christ's body, so we'll take it together.
We just give you things for Paul God in heaven, mm -hmm. for the life and knowledge that you've given us through Jesus Christ. That we're able to come together as <coughs> your church in one accord now. We be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. And we look forward to that day that we keep looking up to, Lord. Let's take the fruit of the vine together. We give you thanks for Bob God for the fruit of the vine as we drink this. May your healing hand reach up from heaven. Heal us now, Lord, and restore us of everything that needs to be healed and restored from crown of our heads and the soles of our feet in the almighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for giving us spiritual food and drink, which is your for your eternal life with Jesus, Lord, and that you're gathering your church together this way. For you, is the power and glory forever. Mm -hmm. and may your Holy Spirit fill us now with your mercy, grace, and love. With all many name of Jesus. Amen.